Hello and welcome to NASCOM Technology and Leadership Forum 2024. Today, we are touching base with technology leaders to find out how generative AI is going to impact our lives, lifestyles, and businesses. I have with me Mr. Akhilesh Ayer, EVP and Global Business Unit Head, WLS Triange joining me now. Thank you so much, Akhilesh, for speaking with us. My pleasure. Now, beyond content creation, what are the best use cases for generative AI that companies like yours are using as of now? Great question. You know, generative AI is popularly thought to be a content generation mechanism, so to speak. Hmm. But with it can great applications in marketing. With great applications in marketing, but it can it can classify information, it can edit information, summarize information. It can summarize information. It can do a few things. But if you look at uh, applications across industry, it's quite wide varying, right? I think you spoke about marketing. I'll give you a real life example first to start off with that. Uh, we work with a, a very large retailer, and we do personalization programs for them. Which means, uh, if Anisha, for instance, is a customer. What is that offer that we as a retailer could send to you in what time, what price, which channel, what time of the day, what should be the packaging, etc. So there's already an AI ML ecosystem powering the intelligence to be able to offer uh, this, this offer to you. But we club it with generative AI. Now the email that goes along with it um, specifically is customized using Gen AI to your persona. Uh, we did this for a retailer and we sent out wine campaigns uh, for the year end and generally email open rates range in the 2 to 3 percent mm. range. With this we had a 4x improvement in email o opening, right? So this wine, is... Wine, why not? Mm. And year end, I mean... I don't drink by the way. So, <laughs> but, so that was one example. But I'll completely give you a very, very different example. There's an insurance company. Uh, let's assume there's a car accident between two partners. Uh, to uh, drivers of, uh, you know, who are insured by two different insurance companies. Now, my client, who is an insurance company, typically will pay out the claim that this driver had with the damage. But what if the fault was of the other car driver who is insured by another insurance yeah. company? Which means I, as an insurance company, have the propensity to recover that money from them. This, the term is called subrogation. Now, historically, what has happened is there will be like 100,000 claims. There will be a few claims that we will try and pass through some kind of an audit. Maybe identify based on the description of the, of the case notes, um, pr propensity to recover money from a third party and try and recover. Now, A out of the 100,000 claims is only a sampling of claims that goes through this process. Mm -hmm. And then out of every 10 claims, seven actually end up not being a real recovery propensity. What we did was we automated the whole process of the ingress of information, whether it comes through email or calls or whatever, and pass through an engine where 100% of the claims are getting uh, packaged. But second, using Gen AI, we look at all the images and mm -hmm. the text notes and the emails that come as part of the claim package, including mm -hmm. images of the car damage, and determine the propensity and the level of damage that has happened, is it high, medium, low? So it not only tells you the level of damage, but looking at the case notes, it identifies the propensity for third party recovery. Hmm. We did two things with this. One, pass through of the insurance claim is now 100%. Hmm. Through, uh, second, the false positive rate, which means out of 10 when earlier seven were rejected, now only about one or two are rejected. Hmm. So the recovery propensity has gone up tremendously mm -hmm. right so now this is a very different kind of a problem where we are classifying what is the level of damage mm -hmm. and looking at the content trying to make a decision whether there is a third party recovery propensity i can go on okay i'll, I'll <laughs> seek some more examples later but i'm trying to understand what is the role of domain experts for gen ai to work great question now i tee this up with my previous example uh, for this insurance example, mm. you will need somebody who understands the insurance value chain. You will mm. need to understand what is the type of 
damages that typically happen in a motor accident, mm. what are the policy types, what are the claims propensity, what does a special investigation unit do mm. when a claim like this comes, etc. Somebody who understands uh, the motor industry, somebody who understands the insurance industry and how claims processes work. Mm. Without this, orchestrating the AI engine is willy nilly impossible, right. Okay. So, that is one example, mm. but there are innumerable examples. In fact, more and more Gen AI applications are based on solving specific industry problems where replacing domain and industry knowledge is next to impossible. In mm. fact, Gen AI becomes so much more powerful if you club it with domain expertise. Right. But how do you balance the extra investments that are required for Gen AI to be used, uh, you know, across different processes? Because you will need extra data, you need to feed the data, you need to train the model, you have to do all those investments. Uh, is it really worthwhile? Does it really lead to that increase in efficiency? Excellent question. Now, if you go through NTLF over the last today and tomorrow, you will see there are innumerable sessions and a lot of companies are investing in doing use cases. Hmm. Now, when they do use cases, from use cases they do pilots and then large scale implementation. Almost a lot of them will actually fall through the cracks because it does not meet one or the other criteria. First, there may not be enough ROI. Hmm. Two, there may be practical challenges. Three, there may not be enough infrastructure that an enterprise has to be able to support the element hmm. uh, of implementing a Gen AI solution. Four, um, maybe the AI model being used itself has some inherent deficiencies. Maybe the data quality is not good enough uh, to be able to deploy. So, not all use cases fructify and see light of the day. Having said that, there are a lot which will see a lot of benefits. There are two kinds of benefits that typically Gen AI should be able to give you. The first one is the efficiency productivity that you talk about, that's mm. table stakes, right? Mm. Now, if I'm going to do uh, in the insurance example, let's say 1000 claims processing for subrogation recovery, mm. I will now do 100,000. That's mm. far more productivity than I've ever had. Mm. But the bigger advantage is just imagine the amount of extra recovery I do which goes straight to the top line and bottom line mm. of the company. Mm. Now, it pays for the Gen AI investment many times over, right? So, if you take a completely different example, the, the campaign thing that I mentioned Marketing. from a 2 percent mm. to a 4 x mm. improvement in, in, uh, open. in open rates mm. uh, pays for itself because there is so much more because customers who are likely to buy your product because mm. of the personalization engine you do. Or let us assume, uh, Anisha, I am sure you travel a lot and you, uh, you know, you use intermediaries for booking your tickets mm. or changing schedules, etc. Uh, the intermediary has many people trying to help you when you make a call, mm. right? Now, often times the intermediary is dealing with hundreds of properties, hundreds of airlines and they have got thousand policy documents from which they need to sift through and then be able to specifically mm. answer the question you mm. have. Now, when I club my AI ML solution with an orchestration layer and an el element of Gen AI, mm. what I do is I use your question, I process it smartly, I classify the thousand policy documents into a smaller chunk using chunking services uh, of let us say five documents which is probably likely to contain the answer to your question. Mm use Gen AI to be able to summarize a response from those five documents and give it back to you at a fraction of a time. The customer satisfaction level that you will experience when dealing with this intermediary will go, go up significantly. Mm -hmm. That is the single biggest metric that I am using to hold on to you to come back to me again, mm -hmm. right, for a repeat purchase. Now, that is so much more valuable uh, for me as an enterprise uh, than saving a few dollars here and there, right. So, I think the value of the top line that I can generate is so much more hmm. uh, with this. And that is why I think it will pay off in a number of cases. You have got to be smart, you have got to know which use cases to pick, you have got to know how to inf orchestrate it. You need to have the right technical skills, the domain expertise like you mentioned hmm. Hmm. and the ability to orchestrate a infrastructure solution. But you just said that you know a number of use cases are falling by the wayside. They, they have inherent problems or they do not uh, you know generate the ROI whatever. Going ahead is uh, are, um, are we going to see a lot of Gen AI use cases being adopted at scale across industries and what does this mean for people working in companies you know what kind of education and training do they need to be able to you know make the most out of Gen AI technology being used by a company which was not being done for four years back. No it is a good question again I think there will be some use cases which will 
not see the light of the day, but a lot of them will. Um, last year was, uh, you know, we did a survey and uh, almost 76% of the C-suite survey people that we surveyed were already in the process of either experimenting with a use case mm. or doing pilots. Mm. This year and onwards, we will see mainstreaming and scaling of all of these use cases. When that happens, there is a bunch of things that change from a talent perspective. One, you need three layers of people. There's the whole people who work on the process or at the, uh, at the ground level. They will use AI to augment whatever they are doing in most cases, right? So there is a, you know, I spoke about the ticketing example. Yeah. Someone earlier used to type out the response for you. Now there's a ready-made response that is coming, but they still have to make sure that they understand that the response is valid, mm. that there is no bias, there's no, you know, the, the human in the loop element yeah. is extremely important. So their skill sets will change, it'll become more ju judgment in mm. intensive and they'll become far more effective in sorting your problem. So there's going to be a shift in the way. So AI becomes a partner in crime, so to speak, mm. for a large pool of people. There is an additional layer of people that is required who do some kind of solutioning today, but will need to co-opt Gen AI as part of their solution thinking. And then there's a third layer of experts mm. who will have to design and mm. do the cool coding stuff, mm. etc. Oftentimes, Gen AI doesn't work in isolation. You know, if it were to work in isolation, all of us could be experts. We could yeah. just go into chat GPT, ask a question and get a response. Doesn't work like that in real life. So we need a combination of all these three skill, skill, skill sets. We at WNS, I think are investing in all of these three. We are creating a bunch of our employees to have orientation for AI, understands how their tasks are going to be either different or better using AI, what is the skill sets they will need to have an A, the appreciation of what Gen AI will do to their task and what trainings they need to do. Second, a little bit more specialized training for the middle layer yeah. uh, to be able to orchestrate solutions, understand what infrastructure is required, how does it play with an existing application, how will the workflow work, etc. Uh, bring in the domain expertise required to yeah. orchestrate a, a solution. And then the third expert layer. Yeah. We have partnered with Carnegie Mellon, we have partnered with LinkedIn Solutions, we've got n number of partners and kind of classified them and put them across all training elements. I think with the plethora of use cases that are coming, the opportunity for us as a company and an industry is actually going to increase tremendously. I'll repeat that. It, I, it will increase. The, in the insurance example earlier, I used to process claims. Hmm. Today, I'm going to build in the intelligence for first, is it a fraudulent claim or not? Is there a third party recovery possibility or not? If there is a third party recovery, maybe the client is doing the recovery today. I'll tell them I'll do it for you using mm. Gen AI mm. elements. So I'm expanding the scope of work. I'm going to change the commercial model instead of saying you pay me for 100 people to do claims processing. I'll say give me a percentage of the additional recovery I do. So the market will expand, the scope of engagement will change. I'll become a true partner. And in that process, I will have an amalgamation of skill sets which is different, like you said, from what it was, but better and richer hmm. in many which but ways. But what kind of cultural shift within an organization will be required? Because you explained the different layers, but you know, not everybody will be as embracing of technology as uh, you know, each layer. There could be some you know, resistances. I think uh, the way to think about this, Anisha, is um, one of India's biggest trend, let's say and I'm wearing an India hat over the last 20 years is not only the fact that we've got a large pool of graduates and STEM graduates, etc. available uh, who are technically competent. That's definitely part of the strength, but it's not the only strength. I think the biggest trend that India has is a bunch of all of these people who are hungry for success, who are extremely curious, who are willing to learn, who are willing to adapt, who are willing to go the extra mile hop on a plane, go to a client mm. location, bring in, the, put in the effort to understand the domain, etc. Mm. These softer skills is what makes us successful, mm. as much as the fact that we've got a large pool of uh, employable, uh, technically trained people. Mm. These skills are still going to be relevant, right? I think what is important in the cultural ecosystem is how do you relook at the job function? Mm. The job is going to be there, the tasks will change. How does the task be reimagined? So the cultural context is to make sure that we reinforce learnability 
in our workforce. We reinforce the fact that domain is going to be important. We reinforce the fact that uh, there is going to be process reimagination. We reinforce the fact that curiosity of solving a business problem is there. So, these points are going to be reinforced. They do not need to be changed. Yes. It is just that the way the work gets done today will have a different shift. There will be some technical upgradation, some technical shifts we need to make. We do that as part of our yeah. workforce. That is the way That's I would That is called upskilling these days. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, what AI trend or technology do you think will be the most transformative in 2024 and beyond? I do not know if it is transformative or not Anisha, but the changes that I see happening like I mentioned, there is going to be a lot of mainstreaming and scaling up. Uh, of AI that will happen from POCs and use cases. It's become, it will become much more <coughs> mainstream. At WNS Trans, we've got platforms. Now we are in the platforms, we are pre packaging pre built AI ML models. We will have ML, ML ops as part of it. There will be data security, there will be data privacy, all of that packaged in a way so that when a client is ready to embrace it, we've got a full Sweet shebang ready. of suite. To be able says, to Mujhe nahi chahiye. Iski kya hai? Is pe itna kharcha then? Um, generally, clients uh, often times are only looking for outcomes. <laughs> so, if you are able to give them the outcome, they mm. actually care less mm. about um, you know the, the ingredients mm. that you do. But you got to have the ingredients to be able to deliver the, the outcomes. Outcome. So, the first change is going to be the scaling mm. uh, of of things. There's going to be some technological shifts that will happen right there will be a lot more small scale llms so to speak mm. so the large scale models are very very large with hundreds of billions of parameters the small scale uh, models will still have a few billion may not be hundreds but they are much focused much more domain intensive mm. much more functional intensive what it does is it's more specific uses less computational power uh, is customized to a use case so oftentimes ends up being more effective so mm. that will become one trend there will be um, a balance between open LLMs and proprietary LLMs mm. today. There are some which are proprietary, you have got to buy a subscription, etc. And you know, they need a support ecosystem to be able to do that. There will be more open mm. LLMs and you know, people will be watching in 2024 if they scale up to the proprietary ones and do you have more options to be able to, uh, to play with them. There is going to be a lot more focus on governance on responsible AI, ethical AI, etc. I think the world will come to a much greater convergence of the understanding of the parameters of how these need to be executed upon. You can already see a lot of action, US is coming with an AI bill, EU is coming with something, India already has some regulation, NASCOM has put up a whole list of items for responsible AI and all of us as participants have contributed to it. So, I see convergence of all of that happening to make sure you know the world is a much better place. So, I see these things coming together in s some shape and form. You know I think there is also a greater realization of human in the loop hmm. uh, that is required. So, all the scaremongering that was happening last year uh, as to what happens to jobs etcetera. Hmm. I think it settled down now it will settle down even more uh, because people will realize that for the solution to be effective you will need humans in different Coexist. roles to make mm. sure that it is all effective. In fact, the role will only be enhanced, but it will become a tool uh, that makes things much more better, faster, more productive uh, for all of us and we, I think we should be smiling. <laughs> you are smiling. Thank you so much Akhilesh for speaking with My me. My pleasure. Pleasure Thank listening you. to you. Thank, Thank you. you.